shows here. And the great thing about technology these days is that we can watch it in recording. So that's always a good thing. I'm Denise Fleck. I'm the board president of the Great Puzzle Organization. And if you've tuned into other of our monthly webinars, you may have heard my journey with loving senior dogs. But even if you haven't, Welcome to Gray Muzzle's monthly webinar series. We're delighted to have you. And we like to think of our webinar series as the go-to spot to learn about senior dog care and health because it's just so wonderful sharing your life with an older best friend. We're really happy to have you with us today. And today we're gonna to learn about our senior dogs choppers, these white per pearly whites that may not always be pearly white, but whatever they are, they do help our pets um, chew their food and play with their toys and all sorts of things. But you may even learn that some pets without them can get along just fine. And personally, I know that no matter how good of pet parents we are, Dental care is one of those things that often gets neglected. You know, we may be the absolute number one dog mom and dog dad, but somehow that's the one thing that gets brushed to the side. No pun intended there. <laughs> <laughs> um, disease in the mouth can actually travel through the bloodstream and it can affect major organs. So we're really excited to have Dr. Heidi LaPrise with us today to discuss dental disease in older dogs. Studies have shown that our older best friends have a higher incidence of periodontal disease, which is an active infection in the oral cavity, and it can impact their overall health. Dr. Laprise is going to explain how with good pre-op exams and personalized anesthetic protocols, the risks of anesthesia can be minimized. And I know that's a concern I'm always hearing from pet parents. You know, I don't want my dog to go under anesthesia, but in the meantime, that dog may be suffering from great infection. So to that point, Dr. Laprise is going to share the benefits of resolving these oral infections, and they are sometimes so profound that dogs start acting like puppies again after treatment. And I will tell you, I have personally heard that from friends. Um, you know, they hesitated and hesitated to get their dog in and get the extractions done. And sure, there's a little bit of a healing period, but once the gums have healed, those dogs really, you know, think of, think of it yourself. We're all grumpy if we have a toothache. What if you think you have a mouthful of toothaches? <laughs> so let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Laprise. Heidi Laprise is a veterinary dental specialist, senior pet advocate, and I'm really honored to say an advisory board member of the Gray Muzzle Organization. She graduated from Texas A&M University in 1983 and became a board certified veterinary dentist in 1993. In 2003, she joined the veterinary specialty team of Pfizer Animal Health and in 2010 became the senior technical manager for Burbat Corporation. In 2014, Dr. Laprise returned to dental specialty practice in Flower Mound, Texas. Um, she has authored and co-authored three dental texts, including the second edition of Five Minute Veterinary Consult, Clinical Companion, Small Animal Dentistry, and has written many chapters and articles and lectured internationally. She helped organize and was the first president of the International Veterinary Senior Care Society, whose mission is to provide resources targeting the complete health needs of senior pets to the veterinarian, their team, and clients. Currently, she hails from Kerrville, Texas, and is semi-retired, but does go into, and I'm going to let her pronounce it because I'm probably <laughs> going to make a mess of it, Cibolo or Chibolo Creek? Cibolo Creek. Very good. Yes. Cibolo Creek. Awesome. So without further ado, I'm going to turn the floor over to Dr. Laprise, and for the most part, we're going to hold questions till the end of her presentation, but please feel <laughs> free to go ahead and put them into the chat box there, and she'll be monitoring as I will and Amanda, our great administrator for the Gray Muzzle Organization. And if it seems pertinent at the time, we might just interrupt her or she'll interrupt herself and pop in with an answer. But feel free to keep chatting away in the box and I'll see you at the end. Bye bye for now. Thank you, Denise. Well, welcome everybody and let's, let's get started. So we're going to talk about senior dental care and with very, very few exceptions, they are not too old. 
So thanks very much to the Great Muzzle Organization. This group, if you're signing on, you know, they're ph phenomenal. They really help to improve the life at at-risk senior dogs. They do their fun funding and supporting. I believe it was almost, what, 880000 a huge number, that they help provide grants to organizations that help take care of these older pets. So they also have their summer smile campaign that really kind of focuses on the dental care and so many more projects. So as we talk about dogs and even cats <clears throat> in our dogs, senior is not seven or seven is not senior all the time. And in fact, we don't just multiply their age by seven to get their relative age in human years because there's a lot of differences depending on the size of the dog. Now, the American Animal Hospital Association states that seniors are at 75% of their expected lifespan. And if you know what your particular dog's lifespan is going to be, you can figure out when senior is. So a lot of times we have to make guesstimates because those larger dogs, unfortunately, don't stay with us as long. So they may be senior at four or even five years of age. See that relative age graph. We know it's not just age times seven because there is such a big difference between the small dogs and the large dogs. The small dogs definitely live longer. The older dogs have shorter lifespans. There's even specific breed life expectations that you can look on different websites. At times, I think they're a little optimistic with the expected lifespan for a particular breed. But even within this graph, say you have a 10-year-old dog that is 60 pounds. If you look across, then you're looking at about a 66-year-old person. And the one thing that's not my favorite part about this chart is they say that senior starts around 50. I, I take I take great um, offense at that, but you know I've heard 60 is the new 30 anyway. So we still like to look at these senior because when we start getting older, we need better care. So I'd rather identify them at around that 50-ish year for people. For big dogs, that's going to be around five to six years. Small dogs, maybe nine years. But you know what? There's also individual differences. You've seen the really healthy 80 year old person and you've seen the really unhealthy 40 year old person. So we don't just talk about lifespan. We love talking about health span, good quality of life, healthy years. So talking about the oral cavity, the most common thing we see is periodontal disease. And periodontal disease is infection and inflammation of tissues with the tissues that surround and support the teeth. So we're talking about the gum tissue where we can get gingivitis, certainly the bone socket there. And when we have extensive disease, we can get bone loss like on the right side of this picture. The periodontal ligament in between tooth and bone is very important. It serves as a cushion and even a barrier. And the thing of it is, this is a progressive disease. And if we don't treat it, then we're gonna have ongoing issues. So, as we look at periodontal disease and periodontal disease in senior dogs, it is very, very common. In fact, it's been estimated that 75 to 80% of dogs over two years of age have some level of periodontal disease, infection, inflammation. This incidence has been shown to increase as pets get older. Let's face it, as the teeth are there longer, and if we do absolutely meticulous care with home care and professional care, that may not progress, but typically it does. We also see an increased prevalence, incidence of periodontal disease in smaller dogs because they have smaller amounts of bone and gum tissue. And where a bacterial destruction of tissues of two to three millimeters may not make a big difference in the canine tooth of a Great Dane, it's gonna make a big difference in the small teeth of a Chihuahua or smaller dog. Small dogs live longer, have more periodontal disease. So we see a lot of small, older dogs with extensive periodontal disease. We'll also see other disease such as broken teeth and even tumors, some type of cancer. So the signs of periodontal disease, bad breath is one of them. 
Although bad breath can also come from gastric, stomach issues, different things as well. And sometimes this periodontal disease breath happens so gradually that you may not even notice it that much, especially if you're with your pet every day. Um, as we see some of our patients that come in the room, as we, we go into the room ourselves, we can certainly smell it. And a lot of times, the last thing they do is give their, they give their owner a big kiss right before they leave. And it's like, ooh, that's, that's not very fun. You know, maybe they've changed their eating habits. Maybe they're not eating hard food or excited for their treats like they used to be, or certain toys, or maybe they're chewing on one side of their mouth versus the other. They can't even stop eating altogether. But I tell you what, I've seen some pretty horrible mouths and the dogs are still eating just fine. So don't think, my dog's eating okay, his teeth are probably all right. In people, periodontal disease is one of those silent diseases, one of those silent killers, because it can happen so slowly and gradually that we really don't notice what's going on. But if that appetite is not good and they're not feeling well, or maybe there is an oral tumor, maybe there's some weight loss as well. We don't just look at the weight especially in seniors, as just pounds, but also the muscle tone as well. So sometimes the signs of periodontal disease are not noticeable. They really only become painful much later in the disease if there's an abscess or if one tooth is very mobile and hitting. Usually there are hidden problems of periodontal disease. And the only way we can see some of these problems are with general anesthesia, good examination, and dental x-rays. Extremely important to do a full evaluation. So periodontal disease itself starts when plaque accumulate on the tooth surface. Now plaque is some, some saliva, some proteins in that, some bacteria, food material, whatnot. You know, when you wake up and that, that film that's on your teeth and we brush it off, what, two, three times a day? If the bacteria in the plaque remains, it can cause inflammation and infection. Just like in this dog, we've ended up having gum loss and even bone loss to where the space in between the roots is showing. The thing of it is, once this plaque is there, minerals from saliva can turn it into tartar or calculus, which is very hard. We can brush off plaque, but we can't brush off calculus or tartar. So that's when we need a good thorough cleaning at the veterinarians. The other part of this is in trying to fight the bacteria, the body comes with its immune system and different enzymes and actually destroys some of its own tissue trying to fight the bacteria. So not only do we look at getting rid of the bacteria, but sometimes we have to help support the body to make sure it's not too reactive. Once we lose those tissues surrounding the tooth, we can lose the teeth. So periodontal disease is actually all the tissues around the tooth. The tooth may be perfectly healthy, but has nothing to hold it in. And sometimes when those tissues are lost, especially in the lower jaw of little dogs, sometimes the bone can be at risk as well. So we look at different stages of periodontal disease. Now, it's not just based on how much calculus is there, tartar is there, or whatnot. We actually base it on how much of that tissue is lost, the gum tissue, the bone, the periodontal disease, the periodontal ligament. Stage one, we may have some inflammation and in fact, a lot of tartar, but if there's no loss of those tissues, then that is stage one. If we have a 20% loss of the gum and bone and everything else, that's stage two. Not too bad, we can treat, we can keep it from getting any better. Up to 50% attachment loss is stage three. And here's where we have to make some decisions. Do we just clean and try to treat or should we extract? A lot of things go into that decision. If we have greater than 50% attachment loss around a tooth, typically extraction is the best because if it has that much loss, the tooth is not stable. We really can't get to the deepest areas to clean it well. And that infection and inflammation can stay in that body. I was mentioning that if we have periodontal disease that is not treated, we lose the tissues and sometimes puts the bone at risk. 
And this is not uncommon in small breed dogs. This large lower first molar is a very important tooth. But if we get infection around it, in fact, this one had deep infection on the back root that ended up getting bacteria inside the tooth, killing the tooth with additional bone loss. And then sometimes it just takes jumping off the bed wrong or a big dog jumping on a little dog. I've got a case tomorrow that's coming in with a prob probable broken jaw and we've got a fracture here. The thing of it is, particularly in these smaller, older dogs, healing may not be so good. This is diseased bone. We have quite a gap there. As an older patient, we don't have as much healing capabilities. And sometimes it's very difficult to repair. In some of these dogs, we make them more comfortable by removing that infected tooth and even removing that infected piece of bone in front it's called a mandibulectomy, suture up the soft tissue. And other than the tongue hanging out from that side, they really do quite well. So it's pretty impressive what these guys can, how, how good they can feel once we get rid of that infection. This is important because the infection, as, as Denise was saying, does not stay in the oral cavity. In fact, we always used to talk about the bacteria getting into the bloodstream, causing infection at further places in the body, heart, heart valves, kidneys, liver. We've come to understand even more. And as I'm getting more interested in senior care, there's a term called inflammaging. Any chronic inflammation that is not taken care of and treated uh, appreciably can actually impact the body as much as a bacteria in the bloodstream can. This inflammation impacts all these, all these organs and it speeds up aging, morbidity, which is illness and mortality, which is death. So getting the mouth healthier can help remove this source of chronic inflammation, which is so important. In theory, periodontal disease is completely preventable. Yeah, there's some individuals that we'd have to back off that statement a bit. But if we get regular care early on from the time they're young, in fact, the American Animal Hospital Association mentions getting the first dental cleaning by one year of age, especially in smaller dogs, maybe two years of age in older dogs. Sometimes there's some developmental things that are already going wrong in those younger dogs. But with a combination of good home care, good professional care, we can keep the, the disease at bay, at least slow it down and maybe keep it from getting any worse. We certainly have higher risk with certain dogs, small breeds I've already mentioned. The ratio of bone to root and everything else, there, there's just so few reserves there that a little bit of a pocket, a little bit of bone loss can cause significant challenges. And since they're so crowded, it goes from tooth to tooth to tooth, just like dominoes. Well, we're gonna add in brachycephalic breeds there, big and small. Shorter face, crowded teeth, we tend to see more problems. And then you get the small brachycephalic dogs, well, you just have a whole lot of fun there. Certainly, if we have cardiac patients, kidney patients, any of those systemic diseases, diabetes has been shown to be directly correlated with periodontitis in people. We need to make sure we keep dental disease at a minimum so these other diseases don't get worse. So early periodontal disease. And in fact, I usually don't see early periodontal disease. So I took a photo of a dog with a malocclusion who's a young dog to show that if you start off early, you can, you can end up having healthy teeth. So if we have just mild changes, moderate amounts of bone loss, Maybe we extract certain teeth and we select teeth to extract at times based on their position. We really like canine teeth, especially since they have such big roots. The roots of canine teeth are bigger than the crowns. That lower first molar that you saw on the x-ray because it had disease, the jaw broke. We like to keep that tooth really, really healthy. So if there's, that's our carnasal or chewing teeth in the back. If there's an adjacent smaller tooth, say like that lower incisor next to the lower canine that has disease, 
by extracting it, we may be able to make the area around that canine tooth healthier. So quite often we'll do some strategic extractions. Now I know the term extractions is not a fun one for a lot of owners. And I have to share a little uh, snippet with you. Uh, an owner of a Shih Tzu came in and we told her we were gonna have to do substantial extractions. We didn't have to extract all her teeth. If we did, we call those patients our gummy bears. But she looked at us and said, well, without those teeth, how could he survive in the wild? I went, guess what? He doesn't have to survive in the wild. You're taking good care of him. He'll do fine without those teeth. In fact, he'll be healthier. So she understood at that point that they're not all just little wolves. We even get certain cases, uh, particularly sent to me, where we might have advanced periodontal disease, but we can do some special procedures. So this is that lower first molar on a different patient, opposite side, this is lower right side. And we have a deep pocket with bone loss on the back side of that tooth. And we have some bone loss between it and the fourth premolar in front of it at the right side of that x-ray. Where we're gonna ex extract that lower fourth premolar, do some gum flaps to really clean that out well, and sometimes we can even place bone graft material and get bone to grow back. So sometimes we can do some pretty amazing things by extracting the teeth adjacent and placing in the bone graft, we can make these teeth much healthier. So we talked about treating periodontal disease, not just to improve the mouth, to improve the entire patient. That oral and dental disease, if we have any plaque and calculus, I uh, talk about cleaning out the garbage or getting rid of the irritants. Um, sometimes we found everything from grass to kitty litter to sesame, oh, just all kinds of things. It's, it's kind of interesting what they accumulate in there. Hair, especially in some of our short haired breeds. And certainly we want to extract the infected teeth to get rid of that chronic inflammation. Once we do that, once we clean up that mouth, get rid of those teeth that are causing some of the problems, not only is the mouth going to feel better, but the body's going to feel better. The other organs can be healthier. And it's true at that two-week visit, and I don't get to see those too often, but those pets usually are feeling so much better that at times it's kind of like, you know, I wish we could have talked you into it earlier. Yes, we can have this horrible mouth and take out most of the teeth and pets like a new dog. But what if that dog never had to go through all that infection and inflammation from the beginning? That's my goal. So some other things we see are broken teeth and dogs have amazing amounts of force that humans don't have. And usually we see a lot of broken teeth with the upper fourth premolar because they're chewing on hard toys. Everything from cow hooves to bones to, you know, as long if it's got a diameter that's thick and you can't bend it or compress it, it can end up breaking these teeth. Now the upper fourth premolar is a very common one. The canine teeth are often uh, broken if there's either, they're, they're going for something that hits, hits a brick or hits a floor if they're used to picking up things or even dogs playing together. I've seen the broken teeth um, of the canines. And then we have our police dogs that break their teeth on certain, I guess, perpetrators, maybe even in training. Sometimes we will have blunt trauma to a tooth that cause what we call pulpitis. And that tooth may appear pink initially, but turns a purple or a grayish color. Well, guess what? That purple or grayish color tells me that the pulp is likely dead. And if that pulp is dead, sure, it's not open like this tooth where bacteria can get into the broken open apex, uh, open canal right there, but bacteria can get in from, from the bloodstream and end up causing an abscess with that tooth too. So again, chronic infection, chronic inflammation. If we have relatively stable pieces the, the remainder of the tooth is relatively stable, we might be able to do a root canal to remove the infected pulp and keep the structure of the tooth, even though it's no longer a living tooth, or extraction to remove that source of the infection. Oral tumors are also something we see on a fairly regular basis, at least in my practice, because they often get referred to me. The thing of it is, 
um, how early do you think this tumor was found? Not very early. Since they keep their mouths closed most of the time, unless you're going in and looking safely, please, uh, on a regular basis, we probably won't determine that a dog has oral cancer until it's quite large because they're pretty much hidden until it's to the point that it's either swelling to the outside or they're so large that they're actually chewing on it and it's bleeding or they're having issues like that. So good examinations. My seniors really should go into their veterinarians twice a year. You can also look, you know, as you're brushing or something, look for any changes, look for anything that's bad. Um, there are some masses that are benign. I actually had three of my four patients yesterday had oral masses and two of them I think were fairly benign. One was benign, but very aggressive locally. So we had to do a little bit wider excision and then was, one was a malignancy. So surgery can help with some of these, not always. If they're really big by the time we get to them for surgery and they're malignant, we have to get a band of normal tissue up to about two centimeters around that entire tumor. And if it's on a small dog, that sometimes can't be done because it would be the big part of the entire face. So early detection is absolutely key. In some tumors, we can use different uh, medications, uh, but usually an oncologist has to go with that. So we know you have concerns. We used to talk about cost concerns, and that certainly is part of it today, because as we're providing better care for these patients, the cost is going up. But to get adequate treatment, it needs general anesthesia. We cannot do even a cleaning and examination without full anesthesia, an endotracheal tube protecting the patient's airway, being able to do a complete exam and take dental x-rays, and then certainly any treatment other than cleaning the crowns is going to be up underneath the gum line. And you can't do that on an, 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 on an alert, awake animal, even if, even if they're tranquilized or sedated. We need general anesthesia. Certainly, as our dogs become seniors, some of those risks may increase. And as we look at those, we need to look at each patient individually, and we do. We usually use reduced amount of anesthetic agents. We customize the protocols. We like going with something that has a little bit of pain management, as well as maybe a little bit of sedation, so they're not too anxious. And we may use specific drugs for specific conditions, such as cardiac disease. We may change the fluid rate depending on the disease. And a big part of it, especially in these small dogs, is the body temperature regulation. I'm gonna go back up to the last slide. The purplish um, thing covering this dog, it's called a hot dog. And we are very cognizant of keeping our patients nice and warm during their procedure. Certainly, as we're looking at this, we can uh, look at manage other teeth. And that question, how will they eat without teeth? Quite nicely. Quite, quite nicely. In fact, this is a little dog that had, remember I talked about taking out that piece of bone? Had it done on both sides? Sure, his tongue hangs out a little bit. He's a little messy at the food bowl, but he did great. We have a question about an uh, elderly dog who needs dental cleanings. And later on, we're, I'm going to give you the information about um, uh, the dental specialists who are might be in your area that you can look up. And if your veterinarian is not comfortable with a specific condition on your dog, find a good veterinarian who is, and it may be one of those dental specialists. Now, unfortunately, there is cost involved and there always will be. Um, you know, we have care credit, we do things like that. We even have um, one older gentleman the other day brought in a, old basset hound, huge basset hound. I've never seen one that big, pretty bad teeth, really needs extractions. Um, the older gentleman's teeth weren't much better. So maybe we can help educate him as to the importance of good dental care. And we talked to him about doing a GoFundMe page and getting, you know, posting pictures of this dog that he rescued and trying to go from there. So yes, there is some cost and we, help out where we can, but we still got to keep the doors open. Dr. LaPreeze, while you're yes. still on the anesthesia, we had yes, a question 
about um, an 18-year-old with kidney disease. I know you mentioned maybe different medications for cardiac, but is there anything you can speak to with kidney disease? Right. In fact, that's going to come up in just a few slides. Well, I'll talk about some I things. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> All right. So if you're trying to find a veterinarian to do advanced dentistry or old patient dentistry, senior patient dentistry, we don't like that O word, you must have a cuffed endotracheal tube to protect the lungs. You must have IV catheter and fluids, good monitoring, body warming unit, pain management. From the very start, we go preoperative pain management on these patients to make sure they're comfortable throughout the procedure. Then we can use less anesthesia. We use blocks to help numb them and then pain management going home. Dental x-rays are not optional. For good dental care, x-rays have to be taken, all right? We certainly want to minimize the anesthetic time whenever possible. And in fact, there are some senior patients, if they have a lot of work to be done, that it might be do it, done better in two staged procedures, maybe two to three hours each versus a six-hour procedure, okay? They also need to be monitored very closely during recovery, because we may be watching them very close during all that anesthetic, but then we need to check on them as well during that recovery period. So to minimize those risks on these senior patients, thorough examination, senior profile blood work and urinalysis to look at liver, kidney, we listen to the heart. If we hear a murmur, I like to do a blood test, checks for heart stretch, I like to have x-rays done. If I have any of these issues that have specific problems, we might have to treat that patient and get them more stable before we can continue on, all right? Because there's a lot of times, there's even studies that have shown by doing blood work on apparently healthy animals, there's problems that are hidden. So that can be an issue. And doing the exam and doing the blood work before is very, very important. Now, this is my former gray muzzle buddy. He since passed on, but he, he was a good old boy. He certainly liked his uh, orthopedic bed as long as the cat wasn't on it. I don't use antibiotics in all cases. If I have severe infection, I might get them on antibiotics ahead of time to help decrease the level of infection and inflammation. Or if they have oral disease, such as cardiac disease, I might go with at least a uh, dose during the procedure itself. These days, there's some newer regulations, and I'm okay with a small amount of food, teaspoon, tablespoon, whatever, especially if they have to take some regular medications up to four hours prior to the procedure. Many of mine come from a distance, so by the time we're gotten them in and everything going, it, it's been at least four hours. Uh, as we look at um, supplements, we definitely recommend that. Uh, Serenia for nausea. It also, we give it to all of our, all of our surgery patients, not just for nausea, but there's a smoother recovery, there's smoother anesthesia, maybe even a little pain medication in there. And I also, I need to update this one, any anti-anxiety medication, trazodone for the dogs, gabapentin for the cats, Please give it to them the night before and the morning of. They're less stressed. Their epinephrine isn't pumping and making them all scared. Usually anesthesia is a little bit smoother and it's very safe. I will leave the water out in the home until the trip to the clinic. Now, if, if your veterinary clinic is used to NPO prior to, you can't do any anything orally from the night before, um, then, you know, that's, that's, that's what they're comfortable with. But some of the newer American Animal Hospital Associations are allowing us to provide a little bit of food. In fact, with my brachycephalic patients, I try to get them on acid reducers ahead of time because they will usually have some regurgitation. It's part of the breeds, but the acid reducers will make it less acidy. Okay, preparing for the procedure. I have a cocktail glass on here because we use a cocktail, a mixture of different medications. Remember that pre-visit anxiety medication. We do a good examination. We give preoperative medication, usually injection that helps with a little bit of sedation and pain management. We get in an IV catheter, get the fluid started. 
and then the injection to help make them sleepy. You may have heard of propofol. We use alfaxan for our cardiac patients. Then we make sure we stabilize them well. We get on all the monitoring, make sure they're doing well. And then we get ready to start the procedure. So specifically for some of our issues, if your dog has a heart murmur or any other disease, and by the way, I'm gonna make a really big push here for do not feed grain-free. You can go on the FDA website and see that grain-free has been linked to cardiomyopathies. We had less than a two-year-old um, Doberman, cardiomyopathy anyway, that was on grain-free and he's already having a severe issue with his heart. But what I typically see are those older dogs that might have some valve problems, mitral valve usually, and maybe that mitral valve got worse without having good dental care. It is possible. So we'll evaluate some blood work and chest x-rays. If those aren't too bad, then I'm okay with going ahead with procedure. I might give antibiotics during to help protect those heart valves, and I might decrease my fluids a little bit. But if that pro BNP, that blood test and the chest x-rays show abnormalities, then I wanna have an ultrasound or echo done and evaluated by a cardiologist. Because if the, that blood work and the chest x-rays are not good, and then the echo or ultrasound shows us that there are some significant changes, we might have to go on medication and get that patient stable. And then it's very important to get that mouth cleaned up on that one, all right? Make sure you treat the mouth. Kidney disease. One of the most important things to do on kidney disease is make sure that hydration is very important. So if your pet has had IV fluids or sub-Q fluids in the past to help their kidney disease, we'll make sure they get those fluids for several days before the procedure to make sure they're well hydrated, okay? They might have increased fluid rates during the procedure. Those patients that have kidney disease that need increased fluid rates, but also heart disease that need decreased fluid rates, we kind of balance and, and watch them very carefully. An important thing is to maintain their blood pressure. So that's gonna be monitored well. And we're also going to avoid using any specific uh, medications that might decrease blood pressure. In fact, if they're on medications to decrease blood pressure because of protein in the urine, then we might have them discontinue that for a day or two ahead of time. Just in case you're wondering, the heart on the slide before and this kidney right here, you can get plush organs. It's called iHeartGuts guts.com. But to be honest with you, last time I went to go look for them, it sent me back to Amazon. But you can get lots of different organs. So with our diabetes, like I mentioned in people, diabetes and periodontal disease just feed off each other. With my diabetic patients, I'll tend to go with a little less food, a little small amount of food, four hours before, not the whole bunch, certainly half dose of the morning insulin, and then we're gonna be checking glucose during and after. And typically speaking, um, it usually stays fairly stable. This is also a group that I would make sure if they have anxiety, give them their anti-anxiety medicine the night before in the morning of, because anxiety can increase glucose. On returning home, we do allow them to have a small meal. And if they keep that down, everything's going well, they can have a little bit more and then return to the regular insulin levels insulin levels. So we get a lot of fun. So on discharge, uh, we show pictures and x-rays. We give medications, uh, instructions about the medications, sometimes antibiotics. A lot of times we'll have, if there's any kind of sutures, have them soften the food, but just adding warm water to the kibble. I don't want you to go out and buy a new canned food that they've never had, because then we might end up having some diarrhea issues. And if there is significant um, surgery, use the cone of shame. I, uh, this is actually a much younger dog that had a pretty good facial reconstruction that she actually did quite well. The young heal a lot better than the old ones. And we always make sure we do follow-ups. So if you've had a pet that has gone under, undergone a procedure, you know that first night they're sleepy and they may look a little goofy, almost seem like a drunken soldier, sailor. Uh, they may be a little bit more vocal, especially if they're anxious. The first few days, a little slower than usual, may not eat as well initially. Uh, they may not be drinking a lot of water, 
but monitor their urine. If they're still urinating, then remember they got IV fluids. They might be getting more water in their food. They might not, not have to drink as well as much. And then on that two week visit, we check the sutures, make sure he, they're healing well. And so many times they feel so much better. We'll go back to the regular diet. We'll talk about home care. And if there was periodontal disease, I sometimes don't like to wait 12 months because 12 months a year to us isn't the same as 12 months to them. In fact, I go six every six months to my dentist. So think about doing on a regular basis to keep this mouth healthy. So at home, what can we do? Certainly make sure we keep those regular exams and regular professional care. Home care is absolutely helpful. It can vary as to how much you can do for any particular patient. There are some kitty cats out there, may have some elderly owners that you might not want to encourage any kind of brushing because they might not be a happy cat. But brushing is still the gold, gold standard. Doing dental wipes for direct contact on the tooth can help. Dental diets can help. Appropriate dental chews and the solutions and gels. The Veterinary Oral Health Council has a grouping of products that have been through testing and have met a standard. That doesn't say if it doesn't have the VOHC emblem that it's no good, but at least with these, we know what has been that they have been tested. So brushing is a gold standard. In the room, I actually like to have the dogs do their own taste test and see which one they like the best. And if they like that the best, then guess what? That's the flavor that we're gonna send home. And then start out slow and build from there. Dental wipes I've become rather fond of, um, even with cats and small dogs. The brushing I even like you doing from the side or from behind because coming from the front is, a, is an assertive type of motion. So brush, rub the face from behind, use this wipe, pull back on the lips to where you can actually feel your finger touching the teeth. But with a cat especially, pretend you're just rubbing the side of their face, make sure they get a little bit of lovings with it, scratch their chin, see? The cats can let, even cats can let you do some. And keep petting on them, keep telling them what a good kitty they are. And even at the end, he still likes me enough to want a good ear scratch. So home care is possible and I've seen home care make a difference. Remember I was talking about those broken teeth and if they have any kind of chew, make sure they're bendable, flat, that they don't have a uh, diameter they can crunch between those carnasal teeth, those chewing teeth and solid, solid, solid. I wish I could put my, my cards by this bin of hard, thick bones. Sure dogs love them. They taste good. They actually smell kind of yucky at times, especially once they've been chewing on them. Um, we made the slides. So thank you for supporting our dental practice. Give your dog more, more antlers. That way we can do more extractions and root canals. So watch out for those hard chews. The thing we know is the best senior care we can do is treat every single life stage, no matter what the disease, but especially dental disease. If we get good periodontal treatment and care and home care at a young age, we're gonna be less likely to have severe disease older and we know what impact that can have on systemic health. So good home care, the right kind of treats, regular exams, and we can end up having some pretty healthy senior pets. Because we don't wanna just expand the years, we wanna make sure those years are healthy years. And I was very pleased. I met with a group that I'll talk about in just a minute that um, their emphasis was on health span. I went, yes, I've been using that word. I love health span. We want good years, healthy years, free from disease, or at least minimized by disease effects. So gray muzzle, a quick thank you. But I also want to in introduce this. It's called the Dog Aging Project. And a and is one of the sites, I believe, Washington, University of Washington is another site, and it is one of the largest databases out there. You can enroll your dog, any age, any size, any breed, and then you act to help give them in information so they can look and see how genes, lifestyle, and environment influence aging. 
They even have some drug trials. So this is the Dog Aging Project. Here is the QR code that you can snap just right now to get to. You can nominate your dog, all sizes, ages, and breeds. And then literally you partner with this research team as what they call a citizen scientist. You will get surveys about your dog's health and about their life experiences. Uh, they will send you uh, for saliva genetic testing, and they may even enroll you to do certain activities and have you report back on performance. So it's just a really neat way to, that they're gathering a lot of data. And from that data, I hope to work with them and see if we can really get a fairly accurate aging chart. So we can see, you know, where, where's the outliers? You know, yes, they may, that Rottweiler may live 12 years, but their average expectancy may be eight to nine, that type of thing. So it's just a really neat project that I've gotten into. The other thing I want to share with you is the website for the American Veterinary Dental College. Here's another QR code for that. If your veterinarian has some anxiety about dealing with an older pet with issues, there are many uh, dental specialists, we're kind of busy these days, but that's okay. Um, and they may, not, they may not be in your area, but talk with your vet and say, if you're not comfortable doing this, are you comfortable with referring me to someone who might be able to provide this care? And the, the specialists, the diplomates around the country, you, they have a listing so you can see if there's some near you. Um, I'm the only one in between Houston and Dallas right now. There used to be one in Austin. That's a pretty, pretty good spread for Texas. So I'm keeping, you know, I, thought, I thought maybe I wouldn't be quite so busy in my summer retirement, but you know what? Every day I go in, we're able to help other dogs and cats. So it's, it's I still enjoy what I do. So with that, uh, let, thank you and Denise and everybody, and let me go to the chat room and see if we, were there any particular questions? Yes, there are a few that I, you may have touched on some of these, okay. but here's one. Are there any diets, foods that tend to accelerate and or retard periodontal disease? And in that same vein, um, somebody's asked about some of the additives to the water and brown yeah. algae. So as we look at the whole spectrum of the things we can do at home for dental care, my, my take usually is if it's really, really easy, that probably tells us the absolute effectiveness of that, that way of doing it. If it's more challenging, it's probably more effective. So the most challenging daily brushing is gonna be the best. Adding things to the water certainly can help. Now, one thing uh, we always like to tell people, if you're adding it to the water and it masks the odor, but the disease is still there, still get regular exams. I mean, let's face it, we brush and floss and we still go in for cleanings, right? And then as we start going for certain chews and the diets that have either the, uh, if it's a mechanical due to crunching, you have to make sure they're actually crunching it, not swallowing it whole, that's important. In fact, any new chew device, whether it's a rawhide or, or a special chew like Oravet chews, things like that, I make sure you sit there with them to, so they don't swallow it whole, number one, and make sure they have plenty of chewing time. There are some such as the Oravet that also have a, a chemical type help that helps either keep saliva from sticking to the tooth more or keeps it from getting mineralized as much. So there's some really good products out there. Again, especially if you're thinking about what I can use, that's the good first step. Start with some home care, but continue with good professional care as well. Great. Thank you for that. I have another question here. My little Chihuahua is 16 going on 17. And as you can imagine, his teeth are terrible. He is also in cancer remission from lymphoma and his cancer journey took the priority over his dental health. Yeah. Now he is really in need and I'm concerned that anesthesia could somehow set him back on his cancer journey remission. Any concerns for dual diagnosis pets getting dentals? Um, Typically not, although the anesthesia itself is a stress. And let's face it, there's always risks. I'm not, you can never guarantee that everything's gonna end up okay. Um, but, but living with that amount of infection, I'd be more concerned about that setting off the body for, for long-term issues. I would say, um, talk with your oncologist. 
talk about or your veterinarian who did the uh, who did the work with the lymphoma. You know, maybe some preoperative antibiotics, certainly blood work, everything else. And then you might try to find someone who has more experience or more comfort and maybe can minimize that anesthetic time. But once they get those teeth out, oh, sometimes it's night and day. It's, it's really something. I mean, we often take things from our own perspective and how we would be embarrassed and you know miserable in certain ways about not having teeth, but our pets don't carry that baggage. <laughs> and it's, yeah. And you know what? They smell so much better for kisses. They do. Yeah. They do. Yeah. Sarah says she's recently adopted a large husky from the shelter. They estimated him at nine years old. He has bad breath and at least one discolored tooth, but he eats well. She's concerned about him going under anesthesia. They don't have a regular dentist, so she's concerned about finding the right dentist. So should you should she go to that website you gave us? Um, certainly go to that website. And it's kind of funny. We were talking about adopted adults uh, before we started the, the seminar. And if they look pretty good, they're two. If they look kind of older, they're seven. And if they really look old, they're 11. So we, we don't know exactly how. The bad breath and discolored tooth, um, I think there is the probability we need to make sure that everything's okay with that. The eating well, yeah. A husky's going to eat good with half of his teeth hanging out. It's tough to get a husky to stop eating. Uh, poodles, sometimes poodles will stop eating with periodontal disease, but not too often. Um, talk with your veterinarian and say, okay, I know that, you know, since he's old, as a nine-year-old husky, that is not young. You are correct. Um but let them know if, especially if it's a discovered lower canine tooth, and I told you to, to extract it if it's, if it's non-vital, um, they may have someone that they do refer to, okay? So check that out, ask questions, and then look around. And thank you for adopting a large old dog. You know, we're all happy about that. Amanda, do you have any different questions over on Facebook or have we covered them? I don't see any questions on Facebook right now. Okay, so I'm gonna put the, uh, someone wanted to see the, the link for the vet. This is the American Veterinary Dental College, AVDC. You can go on there. Number one, it has some excellent client education information on there, but it also has a listing of all the veterinarians who are board certified. <clears throat> Okay, we, we got another one pop up here. What is recommended in an elderly dog who needs dental cleanings but has had a bad reaction to anesthesia in the past? So the important thing is for uh, that we review what was used in the past and see if there may be a correlation with a particular drug. We might have to alter the type of medications we use or use a little bit less, use things that we can reverse I, I just happened to see that that, that was a, a doctor. I don't know if it was a veterinarian doctor. Could be a real doctor. Um, <laughs> You're a real doctor too. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a bad joke. So um, I like using medications that I can reverse. So the effect is reversed and certainly keeping them as light as possible during the procedure itself. Um, and good blocks, good local blocks to help numb things. Oh, you are a people doctor, that's okay. We'll, we'll forgive you. Um, good blocks, make sure that they're, they're doing blocks to help numb the area so we can keep that anesthesia as low as possible. And usually you can, you can work with issues. That's good to know. That's good to know. Well, Dr. Heidi, you know, what I really enjoyed about this was that you used, you, you talked to us in a user-friendly fashion for those of us that aren't people doctors or dog and cat doctors. I think most of us were able to comprehend and understand that. And I've got two new words for the day, mandibulectomy and inflammaging. And I might have a little bit aging myself so <laughs> well, I was so excited when I started getting uh, again into the senior care and I was looking at all this inflammation I went I just came up with a new word inflammaging <laughs> and then I found out people have been using it for about 10 years or so so awesome well thank you so much it's great to hear how excited you are you know when you're able to help a pet and I hope all of 
everybody listening here today will be more excited about trying to take a role and be proactive in helping their pets too, because it's a great thing to have them around. And as hopefully most of you know, Gray Muzzle is a nonprofit ourselves, and we give grants annually to other 5013Cs specifically for senior dog programs. Unfortunately, we don't give to individual people, but we have a grant cycle once a year, and we just gave out this year's grant almost $850,000 to 90 shelters and rescues around the country and in Puerto Rico. But we couldn't do any of this without all of your support. So thank you so much. Um, please go to our website, go to the resources page, and under events, you'll be able to shortly find the recording of this particular webinar and others we've done. Sign up for our e-news and Heidi alluded to it earlier, but please be on the lookout during mid-August. We are going to launch our Summer Smile campaign, which we do every year to raise money specifically for dental grants at those shelters and rescues that, because it just makes those pets so much more adoptable. Oh. Um, they People know what they're going into, or maybe they already have that clean breath and pearly whites, but if not, they at least know what to expect with that pet. And very often we can get those extractions or those, you know, um, tumors taken care of beforehand so that pet can have as happily ever after. So look for that summer smile and it's a great opportunity for you to post pictures of your senior dogs as well. We'll see you again next month. Thank you, Dr. LaPreeze, so much. And thanks to all of you for loving older best friends. Bye-bye for now. As, as I said in, in Brazil this weekend, ciao, ciao. <laughs> ciao, ciao. Bye-bye. <Love it. laughs> Bye-bye.